Thank you for joining this session. I hope you had a good lunch and you enjoy it. So I try not to bore you during the last one hour and that you will learn something new today with us, with Oscar and with Ivar, in which we take some time to prepare this session. And so I will start right away with the agenda. So we prepared with you, for you, a bunch of topics that we are passionate about and we believe that it will help you in your project uh, to secure, to simplify and to innovate for you, for your customers, for your partners in your journey to the cloud. First, we'll start with uh, why data residency matters, what is important for us, what is important for you, for your partners, and so on. We'll have a great testimony of uh, what SURF has done uh, for their researcher. We'll discuss also with the multi-account strategy and operation and what it, it's linked together to make sure that you have a platform, an environment that is secured for your application. We'll also have a quick presentation of AWS Control Tower, that is a managed services in which will help you to deploy secured account, account into your environment. And we'll have a great demo. Uh, sorry, we will have also the data visibility features of AWS Control Tower and a great demo from Oscar. And we will end up with uh, how to start your journey if you want to deploy AWS Control Tower or if you want to start with your multi-account strategy to make sure that you have the most secure environment for your project and to innovate on that. Why data residency? Why is data residency and why is it matters? And we start with our definition. So for us at Amazon Web Services, we believe that uh, data residency is a requirement to store and to process data. So not only to store the data. So for me, I'm from France and I cover France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Belgium, and Netherlands. And my colleague is from Germany. And some customers have some requirement to store the data in France or in Germany to make sure that they are compliant with the regulation in place uh, and with uh, the contract they have made with public sector organization, with multinational, or with other organizations that are uh, linked to uh, the geographical uh, location in which the data needs to be stored. So for that, uh, we have uh, developed and deployed a few features that will help you in this kind of uh, technical challenges that we will see just after that. Just to have the same language and to share also the same challenges that we have and the discussion that we have with our customers and our partners, I can speak about the data compliance landscape, which we have three parts. The first part that, we're sitting, that I was saying earlier was a regulatory requirement. So a government that's, hey, we need to have this data or this, this kind of data if you have the classification of data inside this region. So specific to a local uh, geographical region. The contractual requirement, if you have a partner in which it will uh, be entitled to process your data in the region in which you are working for your customers, or if you have a multinational company that is working into specific region in which they develop and uh, enforce specific policies to make sure that the data are stored and processed, both are important in the same region, in the same location. So what are the changes that we have for data residency that you have, that your partner has, and that the customer has, and that we try to help you on that? The first one is, and I know that most of you have already encountered this kind of issue, is when you have a project and we try to go into production and someone from the security team or from the compliance team says, hey, we need to be more secured, we need to close this port that is open, you need to secure this web server, this database, this storage, and so on, in this access to make sure that you don't have a leak of data or anything that may compromise your application or your solution. 
The second one is the complexity of having the regulation and all the uh, controls that you want to apply into the solution. And you have someone from the security, for the compliance, from legals. So we have a bunch of controls that you need to put in place. And for that, uh, you need to have a solution, a tools, a process, and also the people that we will be on board to do that. And the last one is uh, detection to implement the solution and to monitor what's going on. So you build your solution that is secured, but you want, and you, you want to make sure that the solution is secured after that. Not only for the building part, but also overall the end-to-end -end, uh, life cycle of the solution. So to detect if something is going on, if there is a security issue, or if you need to react automatically or manually to what has been done into the environment. For that, and for all the solutions that we provide and the services that we discuss, I will start to introduce Eva, that have done a great job with uh, SURF for their researchers to simplify, to innovate uh, with uh, all services to make sure that they have a simple and secure environment. Yeah, thank you very much. I give you a yeah. stage. The stage Thanks. Is thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm happy to share what we are doing at SURF. Um, happy to be here also. Um, and at SURF, we do a lot with AWS. Um, other services run on AWS, but I'm specially in charge of the research cloud. Um, so uh, I will talk about how we use it. Um, yeah, what we really like about the way AWS works uh, in our case. Does anybody know SURF? Ah, a few people. Uh, does anybody know Belnet? OK, that's our Belgium counterpart, basically. Um, so SURF is more popular here than, uh, than Belnet. Uh, but every country has an organization like SURF. Um, uh, we uh, provide a lot of services uh, to um, yeah, education and research, and SURF is doing the Netherlands, and Belnet, Belgium, and every country has one. Uh, so we provide the national research infrastructure for education and research. And what does that entail? Uh, well, reliable, secure, and innovative ICT infrastructure. Think about the national supercomputer that we host, for instance large amount of data that we store for our researchers, but also the internet connections between all the institutions that we serve. Uh, and also, we buy centrally all the cloud resources that they need. So we buy them from AWS, we buy them from uh, Google and Azure. Uh, we also have innovation department. So we're doing a lot of innovation in yeah, how to uh, use ICT in education. 20 years ago, I was also working at SURF, um, and we kind of introduced the internet into education. Now, see what happens there. Uh, a lot has changed. Now, I think, well, we're running uh, separate teams for AI. I think AI will change also a lot of what's going on in education. Uh, so, we are still have a lot uh, to do there. Um, we are also a platform for exchanging knowledge between research and education. The researchers of tomorrow have to be educated, so we do a lot of knowledge exchange. And we do that together with our members um, and yeah, try to accelerate together. So we have a saying uh, where you can move fast on your own, together we will travel further. So our members in the Netherlands, typically all the universities, all the applied sciences, institutions, junior colleges, university medical centers, and research institutions. So quite a broad spectrum and different sectors with all different kinds of requirements. And as a research cloud, I need to service all of them. So quite a challenge.
And what is the challenge? Well, we see here a graph with on the one axis the infrastructure, and on the other hand, the number, uh, on the axis the number of researchers involved in these researchers. And on the top left, you see the large hydrogen collider in CERN, uh, yeah, producing a lot of data. You need to think about that uh, in exabyte scale. So a lot of data is produced. Next to it is LOFAR, which is one of the large telescopes. We'll now be also adding the square kilometer array. Think also exabytes of data coming in there. And then you have the smaller projects, like Project Mine, which is uh, ALS um, project uh, for, uh, uh, and they're doing a lot of uh, genome sequencing and think about of petabyte scale. Uh, so, yeah, DNA sequencing has become rather cheap, so you can easily do it for your research, but it stores a lot of data. And as you go along, the, num the, the data becomes less, but the number of people starting to use it becomes more. And if you copy the data multiple times, it still becomes very big. So copying data from one to the other is not the way to go. What we're thinking is that we should bring the compute to the data. So run the algorithms next to the data to make this all possible in the future, because we will get more people using the infrastructure. And with those top left projects, those are typically 10, 20 year projects. You can train people to work with the infrastructure, to work with the, uh, the IT, but on the, the right side, these people are four year projects doing, um, um, and we cannot train them all. So it needs to become much easier to solve it. So we have a very simple workflow where the researcher or the research supporter, which might be a little bit more IT chefy, uh, can create the workspace. They can choose a collaboration with people they work with. And that can be as easy as us being here in the room and saying you have some software you can use and you have some data sets you can use and in the back are some people that have some budget to run something and we could all agree, let's do something together. We c create a collaboration and we can work together with your own login of your own institution. I don't need to create your login. You log in to our system, we redirect it to your institution, we get an uh, improvement there and you're allowed in. And we know that you'll be working there. So if you're not working there anymore, your login will be gone. You have to apply again. And that is what we can do with all our members. We can kind of sync the whole infrastructure there. So if you have chosen the application, chosen the data set, chosen the storage, then you want to move it somewhere where the data resides. That can be AWS, but it could be Azure, or a local cloud provider in the Netherlands, or our own infrastructure, or maybe something on-prem running in your institution itself. So we're trying to make it very simple. And yeah, for the people in the back who provide the budget, I think this is the nicest button we have, the get more budget button. Really like that one. Um, but if you press it, it basically says, okay, what kind of options do you have? Do you have a national grant that your principal investigator has applied for? We con can connect that grant to your budget and you can use it on AWS or you can use it on our own infrastructure, on the institution's infrastructure. Or the institution you work for has a contract with SURF and we build the, the thing directly to the institution. So the whole billing part is also being arranged. Now, after you have the funding to do something, you can choose an application. And this is really simple. Which application do you want to run? Looks very simple. It's not on the back end, because on the back end, we run infrastructure as code. We run Terraform, we run Ansible, and eventually we run something on AWS to provide the infrastructure that we need for that specific researcher. And this can also be linked towards your own um, a GitLab 
environment where you maybe store your own code. So after you run all this and you can log into the system, you see your own code is added to it as well. Oh, and this is then, if you have chosen your wallet, you've chosen the cloud provider that you want to put it on, and you've chosen the flavor, we have here several easy flavors which kind of are often used with some application, but you can add others as well. Then you deploy it, and you can run it, and log into it, and it's being built, everything is done. So that's basically what we're doing, and of course we need to use infrastructure from our cloud providers to make it happen and to see that we can run it all over the world. Um, and especially, and that's something I don't see here often, that is that we need to provide something which is um, available for multiple institutions, so people working from different institutions working together. I see a lot of infrastructure being built for an institution and for, from a GDPR uh, perspective, that's what they want to do but we need to make something GDPR compliant where people from different institutions work together. So it's rather a challenge for us, but all the security features that the cloud can provide, we try to implement that. It's not something a researcher would do normally, but uh, we can, as SURF, provide that for them. And I think this would not be possible a couple of years ago, but because we can use infrastructure as code at the moment, as Terraform, Ansible, and all the other tools that the cloud providers have available, we can create this for the researchers. Um, we can move now to different cloud providers, but we see there's still a need to move to different regions of cloud providers, as I saw in the keynote speaker, uh, stating that there will be much more local regions and other regions available to us, and then something like what um, control tower would be also something that we would like to use there to make that possible. Um, and yeah, I also heard that the developer centers of AWS are coming in a place near us soon. Uh, so that's also something that we really appreciate, that we can work together with the cloud providers like we do with the vendors of the supercomputer. Usually you have NDAs available with them to really look into what the researcher will need in a couple of years. And this is also a technology that we want to use and we want to work closely together with, uh, with AWS on this. So this is the use case I wanted to present and now the technical background will be presented by someone else. Thank you very much, Ivan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you a lot. For Welcome. And I hope you will have a lot more. If we go into what we mentioned into the agenda about uh, multi-account strategy and operation, if someone of you have already seen this slide or the presentation that has been done in Reinvent in 2018 and 2019, I believe, you can sleep now. Just for two or three minutes, I will be very fast, but just to keep you I will present you what we call the multi-account uh, framework in which you have uh, the overall vision about the multi-account strategy, in which we have at the bottom of the slide, as you can see, the strategy. It basically to design what do you need. Do you want an account for security, in which we'll store all the security tools that you may need to make sure that your environment is secure and you have the alenting, the monitoring, and maybe some remediation with security hub, with gratuity and so on, or other partner tools that you can also onboard into this account. Do you want an account for billing? Because you have a billing team that is separate from the central team and that you want to isolate to make sure that they don't have access to any resources in your environment. Do you want an account for logging that will store all the infrastructure log that you have into your environment? Do you want a network account? And so on and so on just to isolate each account and each environment to make sure that it is specific to each need. So for that, first step, you describe it, you need, your business need, your technical needs into your documentation and you define it as your strategy. 
once you do that, you have the second step on the second layer, that is which tool is the most fit for your strategy. First one, do you want to do it yourself, manually? You want to create your own walls, you want to create your own SCPs that are your security policies that will block people to doing something nasty to your environment? Do you want to use a partner tool? Because partners have developed also solutions to deploy and to manage landing zone. So it can be also an option. Do you want to use AWS landing zone? That is a tool that has been developed by uh, consultants, uh, by architects, to help deploy an account factory that provide a baseline of security uh, for the environment. But this tool is no longer maintained. Uh, it will be, um, there, is, there will not be new features for this tool. And so we have at the end, the last one is a family. That is a managed services that we've developed uh, to simplify, to do the EV lifting as we always try to do for our customers and for our partners, to create a landing zone and to apply best practices for a secure multi-account environment. And this is at Blast Control Tower. So we've got different options and you may have this discussion with your uh, partners, with your solution architect, with your teams to, s to select the right tools for your strategy. And as I mentioned on the slide, you can have a mix between different options. Because you can have an organization with your address control tower to have managed services for certain workloads, or you can have a small landing zone just for specific workloads that are not into the, what you call the G1 of uh, address control tower. So this is the second step. You choose the tools, but on top of that, it's just the start of the journey, you have which team will manage your infrastructure, which team will manage the landing zone, and which team will be operating. Can it be your team? Sorry, first, I will go back a little bit. Will it be your partner first? Because partners will be able to manage your infrastructure. What we call AWS Managed Services Partner, MSP. It will be your team that will be managing your operation and your infrastructure that you have built and deployed. Or will it be a team from Amazon that is called IMS that will be able to manage your infrastructure for you. Ever choice to be able to choose the right fit for your needs. And on top of that, the last one, who will manage the application part. And this is the same patterns. Will it be your team? Will it be a partner? Will it be a DevOps or SecOps teams to be able to manage it? So this is the overall vision of the multi-account uh, strategy and to choose the right tools and the people that will be able to use the solution for you. If we go a little bit deeper, you can still sleep, sleep a little bit if you already have seen the slides during the reinvent presentation from my colleague Sam, Sam El Malak. This is a multi-account framework and each block is a part of best practices to manage your multi-account environment. I will start here on the foundational OU in which we have an OU, an organization unit in which we will store your account and you will apply security policy. On the left, you've got the first one, the security. So it's a no you, which will uh, host uh, what I mentioned to you, an account that is called Log Archive that will store all the logs, all the infrastructure for your environment. Security read only, security breaking the glass, security tooling, so each one of the triangle is an account, and which one of the blue rectangle is an OU. So this is for the security part, so still in the same pattern and the same mindset to isolate each business and technical needs to a same construct. On the right, we'll have the infrastructure and we've got two main accounts that can be uh, useful for you if you need because each component, it's a building box that you can use if you need to. If it makes sense for you, if it doesn't make sense, don't use it. So we got shared services in which we can host your DNS, in which you can host your uh, antivirus, you can host your, you can host your uh, storage, 
and so on. All the application and resources that, is, that are common to all your application and all your infrastructure. If you want, you can also have a network account that you will host uh, your connection to your data center. Uh, you can host your Direct Connect, you can host your VPN, just to isolate and to make sure that you have this level of contract for your network part. Some customers may also attach uh, some external uh, connection uh, for partners inside uh, this kind of account. If I go a little bit quicker and I go into uh, the other part that we call additional OU, that are more the business part in which we will find uh, the sandbox, the workloads, the policy staging, the suspended, the exception, and the deployment that are all OUs in which we will define security policy that are specific to each account and each application. And with the golden rules, the golden rules that we have on the bottom create organizational OU only if a guardrail, so a security policy, detects is. The reason why is you want to have the same policy for your application for production, so you have a very secure policy for your application in production, and you may have some flexibility for dev and less uh, constraint for sandbox because you want to facilitate innovation. And I will give the end to Oscar to give you the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you. Thank you for hi everyone. Hi everyone, I'm Oscar Carrasquero, I'm a specialist solution architect, for a member of the Control Tower Service Team. Uh, I would like to uh, cover some core uh, concepts from Control Tower before we move to the um, data residency guardrails and the demo that I recorded for you. So, uh, Control Tower is just one button in top of AWS that you can use uh, to click and start your multi-account environment. Uh, you are going to see uh, that we call multi-account environment landing zone, those are uh, terms that we use interchangeably. Um, that, that, that we use interchangeably. Control Tower, when he's deploying, it, uh, it deploys uh, an organizational unit structure, like what FO uh, mentioned to you before. It also creates uh, logging, and it put it all around your, uh, your environment so that any extra account that you create will have already logging in place. It also provides the option to uh, to, vent, to vent accounts or to create new accounts, and the creation of those accounts take around uh, 40 minutes. Uh, initially, you can think that that could be a little bit long, especially if you compare with other services like uh, AWS organizations. Uh, it takes fewer time, and Control Tower does use uh, AWS organization to create the account. But the difference is that when you create an account, with Control Tower, the account is already deployed with all the best practices in place. Um, and uh, one last concept that I would like to touch there is uh, Control Tower has the, um, had the uh, guardrails, and those are controls. Uh, okay. Uh, those uh, were still some slides from FO. I, I'm sorry for that. And those controls, you have two different kind of controls. Uh, you have a mandatory control and you have elective controls. Uh, the mandatory controls get deployed when you are deploying the landing zone, you are deploying your, your multi-account environment and they are there to make sure that your landing zone is always compliant with uh, AWS best practices for multi-account environments. Then you have also elective guardrails or elective controls, 
and these controls uh, are for you to decide where you would, would like, when you would like to use them, which ones you would like to use, and where in your organization you would like to use it. Um, they, they also come in two different flavors. You have preventive guardrails and you have detective guardrails. Preventive guardrails uh, represent uh, or they block certain actions, so they make sure that your environment remains compliant all the time. And then you have detective guardrails. These guardrails are um, work, with, um, work to monitor your resources and make sure that they are and, and report on their status, if they are compliant or not compliant. If you take a look, um, when we create the, those controls, we use uh, service control policies, we use uh, AWS config rules, just the same controls that you would use. And just as you, we are customers of, of our own services. And what we want to do is uh, to take this heavy work away from you and do it for you. I mean, we want to be a button or a, a, a service that's going to provide you with a, an easy way to orchestrate and manage your multi-account environment. Uh, also, in the data resiliency space, we have taken the same approach, and then we want to, uh, to offer some pre-built AWS managed controls that will help you to, uh, to, under, to simplify and to address data residency. Customer has been telling us uh, that it takes them weeks, it takes them a uh, month or even years, uh, years of backlogs, just to understand and create controls to manage their service, to make sure that the data is secure, to make sure that the data is in a spe a specific locations, and to make sure that the data get processed in those locations. And I mean, once again, uh, we want to provide an easy way for you to do that. We have, um, when you create those controls, that's not the only thing that you need to do. You also need to keep them up to date. And uh, I mean, AWS has a high pace of innovation. And um, I mean, we do that for you. I mean, we do that to provide new features, but we can also understand that because of, of that, it could be a little bit bothersome to, come, uh, to keep up with all the changes. So we want to provide those controls built for you. Uh, to go a little bit more in detail, uh, we have created uh, four new preventive guardrails. If you remember, those are the ones that use ACP and make sure that your environment remains compliant. And we, uh, you can see them in the screen right now, the left side. And we also created 30 new uh, preventive uh, detective guardrails that also work. They, they, uh, they accompany each other. And with that, I would like to go a, a little bit away from the theory of what Control Tower is and what, everything that it offers and go to a demo where I'm going to show, where I want to show you three things. The first thing is how simple it is to deploy a, a multi-account environment using Control Tower. The second thing is I'm going to show you the dashboard from Control Tower and how to use guardrails. In the demo, in this specific demo, uh, I'm going to uh, show the data, uh, the region denied guardrail, and this guardrail it takes care of uh, it takes care that only that you can only use AWS accounts that you have allowed. So basically, if you were to try to deploy a workload in a region that you haven't decided, that should be stopped. And the last uh, part of the demo will show you will show you the experience. We will log in into the console, try to deploy a resource in a uh, non-allowed uh, region, and we should be blocked. So the first thing that we need to do is go to Control Tower console. And there is, that is the first button that will allow you to start your multi-account environment. 
Uh, setting up the multi account environment is relatively straightforward. It's a wizard, only four steps. Um, and uh, before uh, moving forward with uh, specific details of, of, uh, of the steps, I would like to make you aware that Control Tower is, is a free service. So you only pay for the underlying services that you need to orchestrate or to manage your multi account environment. In Control Tower, you have the concept of a home region, and in home region, gets deployed the infrastructure that gets that control tower uses to manage the environment on your behalf. Here I'm just uh, letting Frankfurt. And then you have the, the region denied. So we already uh, reached that stage with this new guardrail that we uh, were that we released in December last year or at the end of last year. And to activate it is as simple as just selecting it. it. I also mentioned that when you activate this, you are saying which regions you would like to, uh, you would like to allow your workloads to run on. And we can add additional regions. Here I will select Paris. And the only thing that we need to do is then continue. If I uh, mention about, uh, show you their slide with a, with a multiple organizational unit and control tower also creates that for you. It helps you to follow exactly that pattern. And here it's creating two specific ones, the security and the sandbox. In the security, it's, uh, it's going to, the account for logging and the account for audit is going to be created. And you can change the name if, uh, for those of you, all use if you would like. I would just recommend them to keep them as they are. They are already following a, a pattern or convention. Now, uh, we need to create the accounts, the login and the audit account. One requirement that you have when you are creating an account with AWS, in case you don't know it, is that you need to provide a unique uh, email address for the account. That's what I'm doing here. Just as with OU, you, you can decide to change the name, but if you keep them, then you are following convention. And we already uh, reached the fourth step. And here we are just going to review the data that we provided before. We have the regions, we have uh, the OUs, We have the accounts, and there is one uh, last piece where you need to uh, confirm that you allow or you give the permission to Control Tower to manage resources on your behalf. So it provides you a little bit of information about what uh, permissions are you granting. It also gives you a little bit of information or uh, introductory guidance, introductory guidance to how to operate with Control Tower. And then you confirm, and that's it. You are already starting your multi-account environment. This is, um, this is the last step, or the last thing that you are going to see. It takes between uh, 30 to 60 minutes to deploy, uh, to create the, the environment. And at this point, you don't need to provide any information anymore. You can just close the browser safely and come back later. This is already how it looks when it's deployed. So that's the dashboard from Control Tower, and you can see, okay, the organizational units, the account that I have, the uh, guardrails or controls that was already deployed as part of the mandatory guardrails. And if you were to have some non-compliance resources, this is a place where you're going to find them. I mean, you are also going to get notified per email, but you will find them here as well. And to activate uh, guardrails, you will go to the, uh, in the left in the menu. And then you can search through, uh, through a list where all guardrails are listed. You can, uh, I mean, either search by, by a name or you can use certain keywords to help you filter out, identify the ones you want. For example, in this case, I'm going to uh, ask to list all guardrails that are related with data residency.
I'm going to search again for the region denied guardrail. And once you click on a guardrail, you are going to go to the guardrails detail, uh, details page. And there you are, you are have going to have more information about the guardrail in itself, like the overview, um, the name of the guardrail, the description, what kind of guardrail it is, which category. Uh, in this case, this guardrail is a little bit different than the rest. Normally you select the guardrails and you say which OU you, you would like it to, to work on. Uh, region Deny is a guardrail that acts of the organizational level, so it's, uh, it works. Uh, the, the setting up is a little bit different. It's, it's done directly in the landing zone settings. You can uh, go straight there, uh, click in that button, and you can see that we enable. I mean, we just, de we just deployed this environment and it was, uh, and we activated. And Right now, if you want to modify, you are going to see that this is, resembles really the, sa the same uh, look as when we were crea creating the landing zone for the first uh, time. You can deactivate it now, or if you already had landing zone, uh, uh, control tower deployer and landing zone created, you can activate it here. And you can also add additional regions so basically, you see originally the first two regions uh, that we activated when we were deploying it, but if you would like to add a new, an additional one or several additional ones, you can do it as well after it's, it's deployed. Selecting Ireland, and right now, just update the landing zone. The, uh, the, screen or, yeah, the screen is really similar to what we saw when we were deploying it for the first time. At this point, you don't need to provide any data anymore. You just uh, can close uh, the browser and come back later when it's deployed, when it's updated. And what I want to do right now is just show you how it's the experience when you're logging in the AWS console and try to deploy a resource in a region that hasn't been allowed. And just logging in in one test account, in a sandbox account with, administra with administration access. And if you notice, I'm right now in Virginia, North Virginia. And if I try to deploy an EC2 instance, I should be blocked. So at the moment I try to I select the AMI, I get blocked. And that will, will happen with any other resource. If I were to go to the EC2 dashboard, I'm going to see how all the API calls are going to fail. And now the only thing, if I switch to an, another AWS uh, region that has been allowed, they, those API calls should uh, work as expected. calls are successful, and I should be able to go further uh, when I try to deploy the EC2 instance. Ah, and able to continue in the deployment. Okay, uh, I mean, we are coming to the end of the session. Uh, I would like to give you with some uh, resources where you can look further or you get further information about the topics that we cover. You can go straight to the resources using the QR codes. Just going to give some uh, time if you would like to take a picture. And I will also encourage you to take a look at AWS Skill Builders, that's a digital catalog of uh, more than 500 digital uh, courses uh, in multiple languages. I also encourage you to take a look at our AWS certifications. Um, they go from different knowledge level, from foundational, associate, professional, all the way until specific specialities. 
our names are in the screen right now. That's uh, our uh, LinkedIn profiles. I mean, please feel free to add those to your network. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for the time.